Differential Equations, Lesson 5.1, Day 5, we're now going to be dealing with driven or forced motion on a spring. So suppose that there is an additional force, an external force, that acts on a vibrating mass on a spring. This is, of course, going to add to Newton's second law, uh, and it's going to yield the following. So, of course, we're so accustomed to just starting this off here. Um, M times the second derivative of X with respect to T. We had the restoring force that was coming from Hooke's law. We had uh, really uh, another factor that was proportional to uh, velocity. Uh, that would be uh, some dampening, uh, and uh, we've been talking about that for a number of days. But let's just say that there's an additional force that's coming into play, and we could uh, call that f of t. Uh, it's a function with respect to t, and uh, we'll see what that would actually physically look like in just a moment. Well, as you can see, as we brought all of our terms involving a derivative of x, or uh, x itself on the left side, which is what we're so used to doing, if we leave f of t on the right, you're quickly going to see that we do have a second order differential equation. It's just that it's non-homogeneous. So when you divide by m, of course, you have your two lambda here. You've got your omega squared. Uh, and, uh, you know, capital F of t is little f of t divided by m. Omega squared was k over m. Two lambda was beta over m. Uh, but here we are going back to our last chapter. How do we solve a non-homogeneous differential equation? Well, first we solve the differential equation set equal to zero, and that's the characteristic equation. So we're going to try to find y sub c. Of course, what we're going to do here is really find an x sub c. We usually write it that way. Uh, most of the time, and we can see usually, almost always, um, you're going to see that this is going to be an underdamped system. You're going to, uh, you know, look at that quadratics discriminant and see that it's negative, and uh, you would have e to the negative alpha t times c1 cosine of beta t plus c2 sine of beta t. Uh, but of course, because e to the negative alpha t, as uh, t approaches infinity, uh, we would have that go to zero. This is going to be known as a transient solution. Uh, transient, of course, that word really is implying it only lasts for a limited amount of time. Uh, but then there's the particular solution, x sub p. Uh, and we'd add that to x sub c to get our general solution. x sub p, uh, p is going to be called the steady state solution a steady state in that transient is uh, only going to be for a limited amount of time uh, and then x sub p uh, would be the steady state. So right now we could look at this and think well my word what what could this you know visually look like? Uh, the differential equation of a driven motion without damping uh, we're gonna just look out uh, at this problem right here without that damping Imagine that, you know, with no driven force, we would have, you know, your standard uh, oscillatory motion as we would see here. But what if this uh, uh, object that is uh, holding the spring, what if it was oscillating as well? Uh, and, and it would give a driven motion, a, an extra driven force, an impressed force. Um, well we can see that's really what's happening here. And we could say perhaps that you know, f of t is uh, going to, if it is in fact going to be periodic, uh, we would expect it to be uh, you know, something involving sine or cosine. So the thing is, if the impressed force has a frequency at or near that of the free damped uh, frequency, major problems could occur. Uh, you can almost imagine, like as the spring is coming down and you could have this uh, ceiling, so to speak, going down, you can really uh, cause some violent motion to occur. Uh, so let's see here. As we take a look at one particular problem, and we will get started. 
uh, in this regard, we could say, look, we've got an arbitrary uh, impressed force on the right-hand side. We could say it's F sub zero times the sine of, and this letter right here we could call gamma, uh, the Greek letters alpha, beta, and then gamma, the third letter there, that's the lowercase form of it. And we'd like to solve this. This is uh, very, very general. Uh, we don't have a particular coefficient uh, of uh, sine on that right-hand side, and we don't know specifically what uh, gamma is. We'll just write it as a constant. Obviously, that is going to affect the period. Uh, but as we're looking here, we can also note that we have an initial value problem. Uh, we're saying that at t equals 0, uh, you know, our position is at 0. And we're going to be starting from rest. Uh, the derivative of uh, x, the velocity, at time 0 is 0. Well, here's how we're going to have to start. We're going to look at our characteristic equation. Uh, and, and that means setting this equal to 0. And uh, you know, as we do that, it hopefully is going to become somewhat obvious to us uh, that as we'd solve here, we'd have m squared equals the opposite of omega squared. So m, if we took square roots, would be plus or minus i omega. And of course, we'd have a 0 here. And what is that really implying? It's implying that uh, the characteristic solution would be C1 cosine of omega t uh, plus C2 sine of omega t. And of course, uh, we're just cutting straight to the chase where in general we would have had, uh, you know, E to that 0 t times C1 cosine of omega t, just filling in a little detail there. But of course, we know that the e to the 0 is going to, in fact, cancel out to just a 1. So there's our characteristic solution. Uh, but now as we look to the right, as, as we're looking off to the right-hand side here, uh, we're going to say, could we find a particular? Could we actually... Uh, you know, do what we were doing back in in chapter uh, four and make sense of this. So here's what we're going to do. Our attention is going to come to x sub p. And we could say, well, let's assume that, you know, because this is, in fact, periodic, uh, we could have uh, the sine of lambda t a times the sine of lambda t plus b uh, times the cosine of lambda t. And let's go ahead and take our, our first derivative here. And the derivative of sine is cosine. But of course, we're going to need the chain rule coming into play here. So oops, it looks like we had a little bit of a, a problem there. Let's uh, fix that back up. So we'd have uh, a lambda, um, uh, yeah, not lambda, but uh, gamma, pardon me. A gamma cosine of gamma t plus, well, the derivative of a cosine is negative sine. But again, we're going to use the chain rule, and a gamma is going to come out as a result. Of course, as we're preparing this, we're going to take a second derivative here. And as we do that, uh, the derivative of cosine, of course, is negative sine. So we're going to have another factor of gamma come out. You can see how that's coming. Uh, same thing's going to happen over here. The derivative of sine is just cosine, but again, another factor of gamma is going to be coming out from the chain rule. So uh, we're going to revisit the original setup where we've got our second derivative of x with respect to t plus omega squared x and set that equal to f sub 0 sine of gamma t. And uh, as we go ahead, you can see, well, that second derivative is right here. We're going to have negative a gamma squared sine of gamma t plus negative b gamma squared cosine 
of gamma t plus, well now we're going to have omega squared times x. Well, just distribute an omega squared everywhere to where we have our x. And it's only going to take us a minute to clean that up. Just throw that extra omega squared in there. And then, of course, we have on the right-hand side, uh, we have f sub zero uh, sine of gamma t. Well, uh, you know, as we're working through this, uh, I do just want to, you know, point something out. That uh, at the end of the day, we've got terms involving sine of gamma t. That's, you know, right here. And, of course, we're also going to have two terms involving cosine of gamma t. We can maybe make those green. And uh, really, we're going to do uh, analysis of coefficients here. Uh, so if we grouped those, you know, on the left, uh, you know, you could see with the sine of gamma t, well, what are we going to have? We've got an a for both of those. You could even factor out an a there. And we'd have an omega squared minus gamma, uh, yeah, this gamma squared right here. So in yellow, what I've just done is I factored out an a out in front. I factored out a, a sine of gamma t, uh, you know, off to the right. And then we've got omega squared minus uh, gamma squared. Likewise, in green, you know, you could see that you could factor out a b. And uh, once again, we'd have an omega squared minus a gamma squared. And on the right-hand side, I'll factor out a, a cosine of, of gamma t. So we have what we were working with in yellow and in green. Uh, but on the right-hand side, we really have f sub 0 sine of gamma t plus 0 cosine of gamma t. Really, that cosine factor uh, more or less disappeared. So, you know, when you look at the coefficient of sine, you could see very quickly that we'd have a omega squared minus gamma squared, and we can set that equal to f sub zero. Uh, when we're looking at uh, our coefficient of cosine, we'll have b omega squared minus gamma squared, and we can set that actually equal to zero. Now, by the way, we're assuming right now that, you know, we have an underdamped system, which is going to be most typical. That would mean that omega squared minus gamma squared, uh, you know, it, or I should say if, if we would have had a lambda squared, we don't even have a damped system, so sorry. But we're assuming that omega and gamma themselves won't both equal zero. Forgive uh, the misspeaking uh, there. We're going to assume that it's not both going to equal zero right here. If they were going to be very close to each other, you could get some violent disturbances. That's what I'd brought up earlier. So we're going to assume that that's not zero. Uh, and uh, what does that really mean? Is It means we can divide by it. Uh, so A would be F sub zero all over omega squared minus gamma squared. And that would also mean that b would equal 0. Now, we had our particular solution. You can see at the top of the screen, uh, x sub p was assumed to be a sine of gamma t plus b cosine of gamma t. So we can say that x sub p is going to be our a. That's what we just found for a. Sine of gamma t. And uh, you can see if our b is 0, well, that's just going to wipe that all out. Uh, so that's going to be our particular uh, solution. We're going to stop right here uh, as we're going to have to finish up the video uh, being able to, uh, you know, get the general coefficient.